<coughs> Are you ready? Yeah. Sure. Okay. <laughs> okay. Very sure. Okay. Well, okay. Very good. So extra sure. That's that's great. So let us uh, continue on the uh, suttas we we're talking about before. Uh, and uh, we have been looking at the five khandas, uh, which I, instead of calling them the five aggregates, I prefer to call them like the five aspects of personality. Uh, and uh, this, the reason why the Buddha, again, divides a person in this particular way is to show us what we should focus on when it comes to insight, when it comes to understanding what a human being is. Uh, and you can see, sometimes it can seem very abstract and strange when you talk about these five aspects of personality. But when you start to think about it, uh, and you start to view it from the point of your own experience, actually it is not so strange, it's not so abstract, it's actually quite easy to grasp what this is about. Uh, and already in the very beginning of meditation, you can start to get some idea of what these insights are about. Yeah? You will all have noticed how the body often fades away in meditation practice, and already that means you already have some idea of these five khandhas and what they mean and how they fade away and how they are impermanent and how eventually they cease altogether. So it's not, it's not all that abstract, it's just that very often the way we approach, when you read the suttas, it may seem abstract, uh, but the idea is then to bring that alive so we can actually see what this is all about. Uh. There's one more sutta about the five khandhas I want to talk about. Uh, this is called the Lump of Foam Sutta, page 8, <coughs> page 8 in your book. <laughs> You are such a genius, Wang Ying, to put these things in the right same pages. That was very, very smart. Uh, that makes it very easy to follow. <laughs> so, uh, this is the lump of form. It's quite a well known sutta from the Anguttara Nikaya. This is, no, sorry, the Sanghutta Nikaya. This is in the Kanda Sanghutta. So, for those of you who are not used to thinking in terms of the suttas, the Sanghutta Nikaya, the connected discourses of the Buddha, is collected into 56 chapters, uh, and each chapter is on a certain theme. Yeah? And this is the theme of this chapter, is all about the five khandhas, the five personality factors. Uh, and um, so it's a very big chapter and a very interesting chapter. Maybe we can have a look at a few more suttas in there, if we have time. We'll see how things go as we go through this. Uh. So this is Lump of Foam. And, uh, this is um, how this sutta goes. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Ayodhya, on the bank of the river Ganges. There the Blessed One addressed the monks thus. So this place, Ayodhya, I think that might be connected to, um, what is that old capital of Thailand called again? Ayutthaya, yeah, I think, I wonder if there is a connection between Ayutthaya and Ayodhya, not sure, not sure about that. Uh, but this is a very obscure place in the suttas, uh, not really uh, something that you find in many places, it's quite rare, and I don't think anyone really knows where this place was. There, aren't, there is no excavation, or there is no pilgrimage to this particular place. So, but it is on the bank of the river Ganges, yeah, and then the Buddha gives this teaching. Monks. Now you are back to Bhikkhu Bodhi translation. This is not Ajahn Sujato. Monk, usually Ajahn Sujato would be mendicants. This is monks. Monks suppose that this river Ganges, in, in India they call it the Ganga, Ganges was carrying along a great lump of foam. A man with good sight would inspect it, ponder it, and carefully investigate it and it would appear to him to be void or hollow and insubstantial. For what substance could there be in a lump of foam? So too monks, whatever kind of form there is, whether past, present or future, uh, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, uh, a monk would inspect it, uh, ponder it and carefully investigate it, uh, and it would appear to him to be void, hollow, 
and insubstantial. For what substance could there be in form? So here the Buddha is comparing uh, the physical material properties of form, if you like, uh, to a lump of foam. Yeah, I'm sure you know what it's meant. The foam is like what you see on water sometimes. It kind of forms up into this white kind of bubbly thing. Yeah, this is what is meant by foam here. Uh, and it kind of flows along with the water. Uh. And it's interesting, if you look at the piece of foam, uh, yeah, it ha has a certain degree of stability to it. It doesn't change incredibly fast. It's not like a bubble, which one moment is there, next moment is gone. It's more substantial than a bubble. The bubble comes next for the feelings. Uh, sometimes it has like a shape. But if you look more closely, you will see that it is changing all the time. Little bubbles kind of uh, going out of existence, new bubbles may be forming in this lump of foam. Uh, yeah, it is moving and changing all the time. It's not really stable, I although from a distance it looks kind of stable. Uh, and over time, eventually, of course, the whole lump of foam disappears uh, because all of those bubbles uh, that, is that make up this lump of foam, eventually they all burst uh, and then the lump of foam is gone. Uh. And the body, if you're thinking about the body, is a bit like that. Yeah, the body is fairly stable. If you look at yourself in the picture from 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you can recognize it's you, but it's also changing. Uh, yeah. This is part of the suffering of life. You look yourself in the mirror, you think, oh no, body changing, getting old. <laughs> this is part of the problem, yeah? Too, too much change, change in the wrong direction. That's always problematic, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and this is kind of the thing about old age we were talking about before. Why? One of the reasons why it is so hard, to, hard for people to take. We attach to this body. We think of it as uh, something that we want to be in a certain way, even though it goes directly against nature. Huh? So lump of foam has a lot of the same characteristics and eventually all the bubbles are gone. Eventually you have to lay down the body. Uh, yeah, the body goes back to earth, the earth element goes back to earth, the water element goes back to water, uh, the air element back to air, and the heat of the body goes back to the heat of the planet. Uh, and uh, it's actually quite a nice way of contemplating the body in terms of the four elements. Yeah, because it's obvious that this body is made up of four elements. It's obvious, yeah, just like any, uh, a, a, everything external, the body is made up of the same thing. So you can start to think of this body. Well, how did this body come about? It came about by somehow, uh, you know, being formed. It originally comes from plants, comes from the soil, that goes into the plant, then you eat the plants, and then this body grows. Yeah, it comes ultimately from the four elements. And you drink water, sometimes you drink coffee. That's the same, yeah? Coffee is also for four elements. Uh, is that right? Let me check it out. Uh, actually, this is tea. <laughs> Let's make absolutely sure. Mm. Yes, definitely elements. So we know that now we know this is elements too. Huh? <laughs> so it's a nice way of thinking about the body. Once you think about the body in that way, it's just something which belongs to nature. Huh? arises from the earth, arises from the water, arises from tea and coffee, arises from all of these things, uh, then you know it also has to go back that way. Uh, and this is just like an intermediate stage uh, that lasts for a short time, for a hundred years, uh, and then it disappears again. Uh. But the body is still fairly stable. Yeah, If you live for 80 years or 70 years or even a hundred years, uh, it is a while. The body is one of the most stable things that we have. The mind far less stable than the body. Uh, what you find in one of the suttas, this is found in the Sangyutta Nikaya, um, I think it's Nidana Sangyutta 12, for on dependent origination, number 65 or something like that, or 63 maybe, can't remember exactly now. Uh, and there the Buddha says about people, people take their body, not take, take their mind to be self. Yeah, I mean, if, if, any of you, any, if I were to ask any one of you, what do you take to be yourself? Okay, you can maybe say, yeah, sure, the body, yeah, we all know we have to die, but the mind, that's me, yeah? That's more what we take to be self than the body, usually, more likely. Yeah. But the Buddha says, actually, it should really be the other way around. Why? Because the mind is always changing. Yeah? There's not two moments when the mind is same, moving from this, moving from that, now you feel pain, now you feel pleasure. Yeah, you, it's kind of really kind of moving all the time, whereas the body, at least, that is stable for about 80 years, it, it may change a little bit, but still there's that stability there. So the Buddha 
is kind of saying almost the opposite. And yet for most people, for most beings, the mind, if you want to say anything is you, it is the mind or the heart, yeah? the, um, the perception inside of us that makes a sense of self. So this is the Buddha's idea of the body, like a lump of foam. Yeah, it seems kind of stable, it seems nice. There's nothing in there. It just foam. Eventually, all thing just goes up, and everything goes back to earth again. Ultimately, yeah. So it's a nice way of thinking about the body. Yeah, lump of foam. Okay. So uh, let's go on to the next one here. Suppose, monks, that in the autumn, when it is raining and big raindrops are falling, a water bubble arises and bursts on the surface of the water. A man with good sight would inspect it, ponder it, and carefully investigate it, and it would appear to him to be void, hollow, and insubstantial. <coughs> um. Just looking at the words here, these are words that are similar, not, none of these words are actually sunya. Sunya is kind of, or sunyata is the usual word for emptiness, yeah, so not, the word emptiness does not occur here, but these are words that are synonyms for emptiness, yeah, ritta, ritta, empty, tutsha, similar kind of thing, also empty or hollow. Uh, and then you have asaraka, asara means without core, uh, these are the Pali words behind this. And thank you very much, Yin, for you're having the Pali there, so otherwise I wouldn't know what those words were, so that's kind of handy here. Yeah. So, um, uh, for what substance could there be in a water bubble? Huh? So too, monks, whatever kind of feeling there is, uh, whether past, future or present, uh, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, uh, a monk, a nun, a layman, a laywoman, anyone, uh, in the universe, uh, inspects it, ponders it, or carefully investigates it, uh, and it would appear to him or her to be void, hollow, or insubstantial. Uh, for what substance uh, could there be in feeling? Yeah. Feeling far more uncertain than the body, always coming into existence, going out again. Uh, and of course, we always crave for the good feelings, and we're craving for like a water bubble, almost like we're craving for a water bubble to last, uh, when a water bubble has no such ability to last. It's bang into existence, bang out again. Sometimes all you have to do is shift your focus. Uh, you may be sitting on a seat, and maybe you have a little bit of pain here and there, getting a bit stiff or whatever. So if you feel that stiffness, then you feel dukkha straight away, or you shift your focus to the tea you're drinking, then you feel Sukha, yeah, so it kind of moves from dukkha to sukha very fast. Uh. <laughs> so that is uh, so so quick, yeah, and it's kind of and, and this is the mind, and somehow still we make a, a sense of self out of these things, even though it is so incredibly insubstantial. Of course, even feelings can be more sometimes be more substantial. If you get reborn in like a jhana realm or something like that, uh, yeah, where you just experience bliss upon bliss upon bliss, uh, then of course it will last for a long time, uh, last even for an eon. Uh. If you get an eon of bliss, that's pretty, it's a nice holiday from samsara. But uh, still, ultimately it is like a water bubble. It's just a water bubble that is made of more slightly more permanent substance. Uh. And of course if you get reborn in a bad realm, then you can have unpleasant feelings for very long periods of time. Uh goes both ways. So it's not absolute. The water bubble can be more or less permanent or impermanent. You will notice here that some of the interesting things here is this idea that a man, yeah, or a person really, is probably the better, maybe better to use here. Um, purisa usually means man, but the thing about the Pali language is that the always the default is always the male. The male is like the default. So if there is a group of men and women coming together, it will always say men. Yeah, this is kind of very common around the world, but that's kind of just how languages work. So sometimes even though it says purisa, which means man, actually it means really means people as well. It does, doesn't, there isn't any clear distinction there between the genders in this particular case. So but what is interesting here is that you have to have a good sight, yeah? It means that you kind of have to be 
you have to really watch, you have to be careful. Uh, the better your eyesight is, and of course, really good sight means to be a stream enterer, but even before that, you can like, have a good sight by being a careful person. And then you have to do all of these things. Yeah, you have to inspect it, ponder it, and carefully investigate it. And, uh, and here the careful is yoniso, this means with, with wisdom. So when you, so this, all of this is like a wisdom practice whereby you consider things and you carefully investigate them and you start to understand how impermanent and problematic they are. So much in the Buddhist teaching is about reflection uh, and thinking about things in the right way. Uh, and some of that reflection can happen at a very kind of early level, uh, like we are doing now, we are reflecting on these things. Uh, and already you can probably see some of the truth in these things. Of course the real deep Pondering and reflection happens after a state of samadhi. Yeah, when you really can have insight into these things, then it becomes deep. But uh, you can already have a fairly good idea what is going on just by reflecting on it in a more, slightly more superficial way when we talk about it now. It still is not that hard to understand. Uh, but the more you reflect and investigate this, the more you will see that it is true. Uh, and uh, that is, of course, what takes us deeper into this practice. Uh, and they see it as a hollow void and insubstantial. And of course the whole purpose of these words is the idea is that there is no core to these things. Uh, yeah, when you look at the water bubble, there's absolutely no core. There's nothing there that you can hold on to, uh, nothing that, that will last. This is the point of hollow and void. Uh, sunyata in Pali is a synonym for non-self, anatta, which means no inherent essence in anything, uh, nothing you can fall back on, uh, nothing that will be there when you want to rely on it. Uh, this is kind of the uh, harsh reality of existence, yeah? nothing to fall back upon, uh, and this is kind of what makes it, can make it difficult sometimes. Uh. So um, that's what you see, uh, and then of course then you have this whole sequence here of feelings that come in various kinds. The sequence was also the same for the body. And the idea here is to take into account all kinds of feelings. Past, future and present. That takes, takes, part, takes kind of care of uh, feelings in terms of time, temporal feelings. Internal or external, in other words, your feelings or feelings of other people. They're all the same, it doesn't matter whether it's your feelings or other people's feelings. They can, these are universal things that are applicable everywhere. Gross or subtle, in other words, whether you are, this can be refined feelings in the jhana state or samadhi state, or really coarse feelings that you have in the lower realms. Yeah, or, uh, so this, this can either refer to states of meditation or states of rebirth. Yeah? Same thing with inferior or superior. Uh, inferior feelings would be like the feelings that you again you have when you live in a coarse realm. Superior feelings, feelings that you have when you live in a refined realm. That w um, yeah, this thought I was no, that has been what yes. Hinangva, uh, uh, again, Hinangva, Panitangva, that's why this, the Pali has been shortened down, but I think I remember what it is. It's Hina and Panita are the Pali, Pali words for this. Yeah? So inferior is Hina again, the same word we talked about before. Uh, and superior is Panita, means like sublime, yeah? something special. And that some of the very high jhana realms, they're called uh, superior in this sense. They are uh, Panita. Far or near, yeah, whether they are physically far away or close, doesn't matter. The point here is to make sure that this is a universal aspect of feeling, a universal aspect of form. It doesn't matter where you go, who you are, where you get reborn, whether you, wherever you are in the past, present or future. This is always, this is a, a like a um, universal aspect of feeling and of the physical body. It has to be this way. There is no escape from this in samsaric existence. Uh, that is the point. Uh, it's interesting thing about, uh, we, sometimes we talk about everything being impermanent. Uh, and then uh, you might ask somebody, well what about anicca? What about impermanence? Is that impermanent too? What do you think? Uh, if anicca is impermanent, uh, then is it then, does that mean it's permanent? 
What does it mean? Uh, anicca is impermanent. Uh, and uh, it's important to understand this, that there is kind of two levels, two things here. One is the things in themselves as we experience in them straight away, like the five khandhas. Uh, this is the reality we can kind of experience directly with our consciousness. Uh, but then there is the description of those things, and that is more like a concept, if you like. It's an idea about things. So, for example, when we say that things are impermanent, we say they are dukkha, or non-self. These are descriptions of the phenomena. The phenomena themselves are all impermanent. They're always, it's always true of those phenomena. Yeah, the phenomena are there. Dependent origination, the same thing, is a description of those phenomena. Now, those descriptions are always true. So they are, all, they are in a sense, permanent. Impermanence is permanent. Yeah? <laughs> Non-self is permanent. Dukkha is permanent. Dependent origination is permanent. What is not permanent are the phenomena we observe. They are not permanent. So there's a distinction there between how we describe things in those descriptions, and then there is the, the actual things in their own right. So you see that in the suttas, the Buddha says, this is always like this, whether there is a Buddha arising in the world or not, Dependent origination is still true. It's just that nobody understands it. But it's still true. Just because nobody understands it doesn't mean it's not true. So it's still th the case. The reality is still the same. The Four Noble Truths and the way of thinking about things are always, always true. Even though the re underlying reality is uh, changeable. So um, everything is like this. For what substance uh, could there be in feeling here? Uh, Suppose, monks, that in the last month of the hot season, uh, at high noon, uh, a shimmering mirage appears. Uh, a man with good sight would inspect it, ponder it, and carefully investigate it. Uh, and it would appear to him to be void, hollow, and insubstantial. Uh, for what substance could there be in a mirage? So too, monks, whatever kind of perception there is, uh, whether past, present or future, uh, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, a monk, a nun, an upasaka, an upasaka inspects it, ponders it and carefully investigates it, uh, and it would appear to him to be void, hollow, insubstantial. Uh, for what substance could there be in a perception? Uh, Yeah, a mirage. You know, you know what a mirage is, right? Uh, a mirage is like sometimes you, you can, I don't know if you can, I guess it happens here in Malaysia as well, when you drive, for example, and in the distance it looks like there is a pool on the, on the pavement, yeah? But actually when you get there, it's just hot air, there was nothing there at all. Uh, that's like a mirage, yeah? It's, a, it's something which isn't real, it looks like something, but actually it doesn't, it isn't actually there. It's a kind of, a, it's not true. We are we're getting tricked by this mirage. And this is here, perception is described to be like a mirage. Isn't that really interesting? How can perception be like a mirage? What does that actually mean, that perception is like a mirage? Now there's two kinds of perceptions in a way. I can divide perceptions up into one that are perceptions that we all have in common. So, for example, we all sit in this room together. Because we all sit here together, we have this certain commonality in perception. Yeah, We can all see each other, we can all see tables, we can all see the floor. We have a, a certain commonality. When we talk about the room, we can communicate about the room because we see roughly the same thing, or we hear roughly the same thing. Not exactly the same thing, because our, percept our minds will make this slightly different depending on who we are. Yeah, if you come in, in here on the day you are in a good mood, and you come on a day you are in a bad mood, even for you it's going to look a bit different. Yeah, the room is going to look a bit depressive if you're in a bad mood, uh, and it's got really bright and light uh, if you are in a good mood. Uh. So even for you, it's going to vary. Uh, and for each one of us, because of our conditioning and background, it's going to vary a little bit how we see this room. But there will be a lot in common. Uh. But there's also an aspect to perception that is very personal. Uh. Yeah, that is really only our perception. So for example, when I look at all of you, then I, maybe I think of friends. Maybe I, th I thought I was going to say enemies or friends, but I, I can't really say enemies, that would be really unfair. But um, I don't really think of any of you as enemies, but sometimes you may see someone you think of as an enemy, yeah, or a friend. 
And then you ask, how real is that perception? Uh, so I don't know if, but Bobby, so I consider Bobby a friend, but I, do you have any enemies, Bobby? Uh, I, can't, I, I don't know, I can't, it's hard to imagine Bobby has any enemies. He probably doesn't have many enemies, but say that Bobby has an enemy, he doesn't even know about it, yeah? And then that enemy will perceive Bobby in a different way, uh, yeah? Or say, I have some enemy, yeah? some people that don't like me at all, then they will perceive me as enemy. Whereas someone else, like Ajahn Brahm, I hope Ajahn Brahm sees me as a friend, otherwise I'm in trouble. <laughs> so, 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 he, he, so, so, so which one is right? Yeah, which perception is right? Or maybe I perceive uh, someone as my enemy. Maybe there's someone I, I find really hard to deal with. Yeah, there's always people who are difficult. Maybe I'm so stupid I think of them as an enemy. I hope I don't, don't do that because it's really stupid to think of people as enemies. But then I think, wait a minute, why am I thinking of this person as an enemy? I'm just being stupid, I shouldn't think of anyone like that. Uh, it's just we are different, we look at the world in a different way. It may be difficult to get along sometimes, but that's okay, that's just life. No need to see them as an enemy. And suddenly the perception flips over from enemy to neutral, or maybe even from enemy to friend. So what is, how true is this perception? It's just like a mirage, yeah, there is no truth. You can shift it according to as you want, basically. And this is very good news. It is very good news because it means that if pe perception was solid, if it had to be like this, you couldn't really develop your mind. But the fact that perception is a mirage means we can always change. It may seem solid, but in fact there's nothing really there. And this is what makes it possible to develop universal love and kindness, uh, compassion for everyone, uh, because you can just flip things over like that uh, and look at things in a new way. Uh. And uh, the Buddha talks sometimes in the suttas about how if you use your perceptions in a certain way, you can uh, go from suba to asuba. Asuba is seeing the repulsive in something, suba is seeing the beautiful in something. So anything you can look at, you can see it as repulsive or as beautiful. And it can be like that, tick, over, it's repulsive, tick, other way, beautiful, tick, tick, tick. What is it? It's neither, it's in your mind. It's our mind that makes these things beautiful or ugly. It's our minds that make friends and enemies. It is not real, it's not in the object, it's not a reality. Yeah? This is why perception is a mirage. But even what is so that is your personal perceptions, but even the common perception that we have all together actually is much less solid than you might think. Yeah. This is kind of interesting. Yeah. Ajahn Brahm, you may have heard a story that he tells sometimes when he was meditating many, many years ago, and he was trying to meditate with his eyes open. Uh, and he was sitting in front of this wall, uh, and he was watching this wall. He has an ordinary wall. Uh, and then his meditation would go deeper. He would have his eyes open. Usually, we don't meditate with open eyes. Some people like that. And Ajahn Brahm is a very skilled meditator. So he would start to go deep, yeah, with his eyes open. His, his samadhi becomes strong. And as his samadhi becomes strong, suddenly the wall would start to collapse and fall away and kind of just disappear in front of his very eyes. His eyes are open and the wall disappears. So how solid is even the perceptions that we have of reality? Even that depends on your mental state. Here, Ajahn Brahm, even though his eyes are open, suddenly the wall is gone. Yeah, that shows you how the mind ultimately is the creator of our reality and how things can change so, uh, so much as a consequence. So the world is like a mirage, yeah? And it's good news because it means that we can change things so easily if we apply, apply ourselves in the right way if we follow the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, suppose, monks, that the ma a man needing heartwood. Yes, please, sorry, I apologize. Yeah, go for it. Sorry, I was just wondering yeah. um, who removed the wall from his eye? He, the mind. The mind is so powerful. It, it, it didn't, the point is that the, the, the point is that um, the uh, <laughs> uh, the wall it was always there, yeah. But but as he was looking at the wall, because his mind was changing, it looked like the wall was crumbling and disappearing. But in fact, it wasn't. When he came out of the meditation, the wall was there again, just like before. Huh? It's just a trick of perception, a trick of the mind that make it seem as if the wall is fading away. Huh? 
It is showing you how perception, how unreliable it is and how it depends on the mind for its reality. Yeah? That's the point of that. The wall didn't actually disappear. Yeah? If someone else probably still see the wall, yeah? but your perception was different. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Suppose, monk, that a person needing heartwood, seeking heartwood, wandering in search of heartwood, would take an a sharp axe and enter a forest. There they would see the trunk of a large banana tree, straight, fresh, and I think this last word, without a fruit core bud, is a strange, I don't know if that is correct translation actually, Adan Sudato has something else there, like a strong tree or something like that, uh, and not, this is a bit weird, I'm not sure what that means. Uh, anyway, so let's forget about that. Uh, he would cut it down at the root, uh, cut off the crown, uh, and unroll the coil. As he unrolls the coil, he would not find even softwood, let alone hardwood. A man with good sight would inspect it, ponder it, and carefully investigate it, uh, and it would appear to him to be void, hollow, and insubstantial. Uh, for what substance could there be in the trunk of a banana tree? Uh, so, t so too, monks, uh, whatever kind of um, will, uh, yeah, choice, uh, I don't like volitional formation, uh, this is one of Bhikkhu Bodhi's uh, translations, act, act, mental activities or, or willed activities there are, whether past, future or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, a monk inspects them, ponders them and carefully investigates them. As he investigates them, they appear to him to be void, hollow, insubstantial. For what substance could there be to the will? So here, the will is compared to a banana tree here. Have you ever seen a cut banana tree? Do you know what it looks like? I don't even know what it looks like. But I, I guess it's just like leaves and leaves and leaves and there's never nothing at the middle, yeah? Okay, I have never seen that, but it would be interesting. One of these days I will t take an opportunity <laughs> and see what it looks like. Yeah. Sometimes you have to see these things, then you really understand what the Buddha is talking about, yeah? So, <laughs> so, in, so in the same way as you unroll this banana tree, yeah, in the same way it's like you are looking at your will in the mind. And one way of thinking about this is that as you go deeper in your meditation, you are gradually letting go of the will. Yeah, if you become a little bit peaceful, one reason why you're becoming peaceful is that the will is being let go of. You're no longer making any choices. You no longer have those intentions. The mind is no longer moving. Yeah? And but then, so you become a bit more peaceful, but then you realize actually it's possible to become even more peaceful. Uh, so you let go of even more of the will. A large part of the letting go process is b the ability to let go of the will. Uh, and then you let go a little bit more. Uh, yeah? And you keep on doing that until you unroll the whole banana tree. The whole mind is like unrolled. Uh, you go inwards all the time. Uh, and eventually you come to a state where there is no more will. Uh, there's nothing there. The will was turned out to be empty. You can let go of the will completely. The mind is completely solid, no movement at all, and you are still there. You still experience. This is like what it is for a deep samadhi state. You're still present, but the will is gone. So you know at that point you are not the will. The will is nothing substantial. Yeah? If you can let go of the will completely and you can't even access it, you cannot be the will. This is what we mean by the will, sankara being non-self. Yeah? is the fact that you can let it go completely, not even access it and be much more happy as a consequence. So this is what this uh, refers to and this is quite hard. Yeah? We, we identify with the will. We identify with the will because we like to do, we like to create things, we are creators. You may have noticed that how creative people are often put on a pedestal in this world. Yeah, people like, uh, uh, what's his name, the, the former boss of Steve Jobs, yeah, of Apple computers, or Apple company, he was kind of put on a pedestal as a very creative genius, yeah. Okay, maybe he was creative, but creation means will, yeah, means willing. From Buddhist point of view, it's bad. 
Yeah, it's just dukkha. That's what the Buddha said. So all this creation is often it's so overrated. We go around thinking, oh yeah, creative is really great. Actually, in the end, it's just dukkha. We're creating stuff. It's not such a big deal. If you look at the kind of the heavenly realms, you look at the samsara, the kind of the how samsara is structured according to the suttas. You have the various realms about the human realm. You have the uh, chattaro mahaparajika, not parajika, chat the maha. Uh, what is it? I, I, my mind is a bit okay. It doesn't matter. The four great kings in English, yeah. And then you have the tavatingsa heaven. Then you have the tusita, uh, so the yama, then the tusita. Then you have the Nimanarati realm, and then you have a para nimitta vasavati. And the Nimanarati are the devas who delight in creation. It's a very, very high realm because creation is one of the kind of high activities in samsara. But from again, from a Buddhist point of view, even above that is the Brahma Loka. And the Brahma Loka is where you give up creation. Giving up creation is superior in Buddhism to creating things. So even though as human beings we put Creativity on a pedestal, actually, stillness should be on a much higher pedestal than creativity. Uh, it is all about creating things. Uh, letting go of creativity is better. Uh. Of course, sometimes if you stand on the higher pedestal, you can go down on the lower one and you can still be creative. Uh. Yeah, this is why people like Ajahn Brahm are so uh, popular around the world, because he is quite creative in the way he presents the Dhamma. If you look over a long period of time, uh, with nice stories and nice He's, very, he's got a very sharp mind, he comes up with all kinds of interesting points of view from the Dhamma, Dhamma perspective, and this is what makes it interesting. So once you have removed yourself from creativity, you can use it and apply it in a good way. But you know something better, something higher. In the end, there's nothing there. You can let go of the will. But we are attached to it, we think it is important, and that is part of the problem. This is one of the reasons it is hard to gain peace in meditation. The fact that we are attached to the will. I am the creator. I am creative. The, soon as the, the moment you identify as creative, you have a problem because it means that you are, uh, you are taking the will to be something special, something beautiful, something wonderful. Huh? And it's hard to give up. Huh? Some people are doers uh, in their life. Have you noticed how some people just love doing, 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 doing? Uh, and they identify with that doing. Uh, and they can't really become peaceful, they can't let go. Because when they do, when you do, you are expressing your, your sense of self. You are expressing your ego. You feel alive. Yeah, I'm doing, now I feel alive. Doers. Uh, but uh, that can block you in your meditation from achieving something much more sublime. At the root of it all, it's just empty, like a banana. Here. Yes, please. Uh, yeah. Um, I did a Google search on the fruit bud. Uh -huh. Apparently, the, there's two types of bud. There's the leaf bud and the fruit bud. Uh -huh. So this is just a banana tree that doesn't have the fruit. Uh -huh, okay, I see. I see. Uh, okay. Mm. So this is about it without fruit, but of course, it's a type of banana. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, good. So, um, yeah. I'm not sure exactly who, what is the, the right reading, because Adam Sudato has a very different translation. I'm not sure what that means. Anyway. For banana tree? What is the Pali for banana tree? I have the Have you? I think it's the uh, Kadali, is that the one? Mahantang Kadali Kandang. Ujjung, I think it's that one. Kadali. It's a plantain tree or a banana tree. I think that's what it is. Yeah. Okay, let's come to the last one of these five Kandas. Suppose, monks, that a magician or a magician's apprentice uh, would display a magical illusion at the crossroads. Uh, a man with good sight would inspect it, uh, ponder it, and carefully investigate it, uh, and would, it would appear to him to be void, hollow, and insubstantial. Uh, for what substance could there be to a magical illusion? Uh, 
So too, monks, whatever kind of consciousness there is, whether past, future or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, a monk inspects it, ponders it and carefully investigates it, and it would appear to him to be void, hollow and insubstantial. For what substance could there be in consciousness? <laughs> So, uh, consciousness is like a magic trick. Yeah, it's like a, this magical thing. You wonder what, whether it's really real or not. What is consciousness? It's very hard to pin down because consciousness always comes with all of these other qualities. Whenever you have consciousness, there's always an object, there's always something that comes with it. Consciousness cannot exist on its own. This is one of those profound insights of the Buddha, we shall see later on when we look at dependent origination, when you're still here, if you're still here, that consciousness cannot exist as a self-existing entity. It depends on the object. Yeah, so it is something that arises always together with the object. It doesn't really exist independently here. So all we have as human beings, we have experiences. Uh, experiences is like a continuous thing that we have all the time. Uh, and one aspect of that experience is consciousness. It is the aspect that knows, uh, that is aware. But it always comes with it, uh, these other things. It cannot exist on its own. Uh, and the Buddha here calls it this magic trick. Yeah? This kind of weird thing that you, it's very hard to really understand exactly what it is. Uh, but consciousness itself has no substance and of course the way that you see that, again you see it by the way it goes from one sense object to another one, it goes from seeing to the mind, hearing, back to the mind again, yeah? It is moving away and there's no overlap between these various consciousnesses. If you see it very clearly, it's like you are moving from one entity to something else with nothing passing in between. There's no it doesn't really hold together. Uh, there's no essence in that movement from the ear to the mind. Uh, if you saw it fully, you will see how empty it is. There's nothing that carries over from one to the other. Uh, and this is one way of kind of seeing, of, of, of realizing non-self. It's to see how this conscious process actually doesn't have a core to it in this way, moving from one sense to another one. Uh, Another way of doing it is then to go all the way to cessation and see that consciousness ceases if you go deep enough. Yeah, consciousness ceases. Wow. Yeah, when you, you, you can't say wow when there's no consciousness. But you can say wow afterwards when you come out. Yeah, you think, whoa, that's really weird. Yeah, everything stops. How, how do you know everything stops anyway? If, if consciousness is gone, how can you know it's gone? Have you thought about that before? <laughs> how, if consciousness is gone, how can you know that? Because the consciousness is required to know, yeah, there can be no awareness without it. The way you know it is by inference. You can see that your mind is leaning in a certain way, moving towards the ending of something, and suddenly gone. And then it's gone for a while, you don't know how long, and suddenly you become aware again, very refined awareness that then becomes a stronger and stronger, yeah? So you can see the process moving into cessation and then coming out of cessation and from that you can infer, you can know that something happened in between. Uh, this is how you can understand the cessation, ending of things. Uh, so this is super refined, this is very, very high states. Uh, and uh, this is one way you can do that. Or, as I was saying yesterday, you can infer that consciousness is impermanent by just following the process of the mind, seeing how things are cut away. Yeah, parts of consciousness, senses, whatever they are, are cut away, abandoned, and then you understand as a consequence. Uh, consciousness is also uh, impermanent, an impermanent entity without substance, hollow, nothing really there, like a magician's trick. Yeah. So that's a very deep simile, like a magician's trick. I'm not sure if I really fully understand what the Buddha is talking about, to be honest with you, but uh, it's a very profound one. Uh, anyone have any ideas uh, about this? Uh, do you like to share magician's trick uh, of consciousness? Uh? Yes. So there's many tricks. There's hearing trick, there's seeing trick, and there is the tasting trick, like the, something like that. Six six sense trick. Mm -hmm. 
Yes? Anyway, let's finish off the sutta. Seeing thus monks, the instructed noble disciple becomes uh, repelled by form, repelled by feeling, repelled by perception, repelled by the will, uh, repelled with consciousness. Uh, being repelled, uh, they become uh, dispassionate, uh, or they lose interest. Uh, through dispassion, the mind is liberated. Uh, when it is liberated, there comes the knowledge. It's liberated. Uh, they understand the birth is destroyed, the spiritual life has been lived, what had to be done has been done. There is no more coming back to any state of existence or being. Yeah. So this is what happens when you do this. Yeah, this is why this contemplation of the five aggregates is so profound and so deep. It takes you all the way to arahantship to become fully awakened. So when you see these things in this way, you lose your interest in them uh, because there's nothing there that you can hold on to. There's only this impermanent process that will always let you down at the end of the day. You cannot attach to anything in there. The sense of self that you have about this is just an illusion. It's a false way of looking at things. Uh, and when you abandon the sense of self, then you can understand that it is an empty process. Uh, and in fact, it's just suffering and nothing else. Uh, and this is why uh, the five khandhas can be regarded as suffering uh, by, through insight, uh, in this way. You have to abandon the sense of self, that is what blocks you from seeing things clearly, and then you can understand why it is all dukkha, why it is all suffering. The moment you see that, you become repelled, yeah? You become repelled. Oh, you thought something that was nice, and now you see it is no longer nice. You don't want to push it away. Nibida, repelled by all of this. Uh, the mind just doesn't want to have anything to do with it anymore. You move in a different direction. You lose your attachment and interest. Uh, that's why you become dispassionate. Viraga means no interest, no desire. Uh, you know, completely uninterested in these things. And when you're no longer interested in it, uh, you become liberated because craving is destroyed. Uh, the moment craving is destroyed, there's no more attachment, there's no more interest, uh, and then you are free from these, these things. Uh, free means lit freedom here means lack of craving, desire. That's actually the meaning of freedom in this particular context. And then, then you know that you are freed and you know that rebirth has been ended. Yeah, the spiritual life has been lived. You have finished the spiritual life, you're an arahant, you don't have to be a monk anymore, you can now relax. Is that what arahants do? Maybe sometimes. They're probably really good at relaxing, but <laughs> what had to be done has been done. Yeah, the job is finished. You come to the very end. Uh, now you just have to relax until parinibbana, and that's it. Uh, there is no more coming back to any state of being. Yeah. This is what happens when you are an arahant in this way. Yeah. So this is this uh, beautiful uh, penu pinda, penu pinda sutta, the lump of foam, uh, pena pinda, upama sutta. And uh, it gives you just a slightly different way of thinking about these five aggregates uh, compared to what we have been talking about before. Uh. So please keep in mind that this is all very profound, yeah? And I wouldn't really recommend you to spend too much time thinking about this uh, because it is super profound and because it is so profound, it is hard to kind of get to terms with it and really penetrate and understand what it is about. Uh, we have been looking at the first noble truth in quite a bit of depth. Uh, and what I really would su suggest that you focus on is the first part of what we were talking about. Yeah, the idea of death in particular is a very powerful contemplation. Uh, and uh, it's a very, very useful to contemplate. Uh, and it's such a so useful in terms of meditation practice. Uh, yeah, it helps you to let go of things. Uh, it helps you to come back to what really is essential on the Buddhist path. Uh, so reflect on death. Uh, reflect on the fact that you can never get what you want in this world. Uh, yeah, uh, wanting you. Um, uh, there's always a problem with getting things the way we want. You can never have things exactly the way you want in the world. Sometimes you get them right, sometimes you don't. It's just very, very uncertain. And that, if you contemplate that deeply, this is one of the core messages of Buddhism. This is why this idea of anicca is so powerful. It means things are inherently out of control. 
It's very interesting, I've just been reading out the Maha Parinibbana Sutta at our Dhammaloka Center and also at the monastery uh, in Perth uh, to the monks. Uh, and the Maha Parinibbana Sutta is the sutta on the Buddha's passing away. Uh, and that whole sutta is about anicca, really. Yeah? The idea that the Buddha is about to pass away is really about impermanence. Uh, the Buddha to the Buddhist community is the most important thing in the world. Nothing is more important. The Buddha is what helps you to understand reality. The Buddha is what helps you with the practice. The Buddha is the eye of the world. Whenever there's a problem in the community, everyone goes to the Buddha. Please, Master, help us sort it out. Yeah, and etc., etc. The Buddha is like everything. The very meaning of life is, comes from the Buddha. He tells us what the meaning of life is about. Everything comes from him. So, when the Buddha is impermanent, this is kind of the biggest kind of impermanence, the most scary kind of impermanence, because that thing which gives your life your meaning, everything, yeah, is about to pass away. So the whole Mahaparinibbana Sutta is like an extended contemplation on impermanence, the highest kind of impermanence, the most scary kind of impermanence, the Buddha passing away. And of course, after the Buddha has passed away, the next thing to pass away is the Dhamma. We still have a bit of Dhamma, even now, two and a half thousand years later, but that too will eventually disappear. And then you will have to choose between Christianity, Islam, yeah, Taoism, yeah, I, I don't know, maybe you can be an atheist, I'm not sure, but Buddhism will no longer be an option. Huh? There will always be theistic religions, there will always be religions that have a god, because this is just humanity, is like that, we make create the gods, we project our sense of self onto the universe, and so there will always be create the gods, there will always be that kind of religions, they will always be around. But they're not so interesting, those religions. Yeah, they're not so interesting because they don't really align with reality from a Buddhist point of view. Yeah, I, this is, you know, this is just my opinion. I, you know, this is what I, how I, I, I don't know, I grew up in a country which is kind of Christian, you know, kind of, not really, but sort of Christian. And uh, for me, Christianity was almost always seen a very strange religion. I don't know how anyone can be seriously be Christian. Uh, <laughs> it's just weird. I start to read the doctrine, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, Buddhism kind of makes sense. Uh, Christianity, very strange. Uh, I, gr the only, I realized the only reason I could, you know, when I was a child, I could believe in this thing was because I grew up with it. When you grow up with something, you kind of get used to the ideas. Uh, yeah. But once, you st once I started thinking about it, once I became a Buddhist and I compared, uh, I started to kind of wonder, how can anyone really believe in this stuff? Uh, it doesn't make any sense. I apologize, I, I'm sorry, I, maybe I shouldn't kind of say these kind of things. Uh, sometimes, uh, I hope there are, are there any Christians on this retreat? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, good. So, um, so don't take it too seriously, but, but sometimes it's just easy to be a Christian. Yeah, it's kind of nice, you believe in God and God looks after you. It's like having a big daddy or mummy who kind of looks after you. It's kind of nice in life, yeah? And it reminds me of that famous that story that my father told me, because my father was a businessman, he traveled around the world, traveled everywhere, and he, he was in the shipping business, and he was here, actually here in Malaysia, and he was having, there was a, they have a dinner in the evening after you know, doing the business deals or whatever it was, and he was sitting next to this lady, and she was, I think she was Chinese, Chinese lady probably, yeah, she was a businesswoman, and then they, they were talking, and she told my dad that, well, you know, uh, I became a Christian, yeah, I used to be a Buddhist, I became a Christian. Uh, and my father uh, asked her, well, why? Why did you become a Christian? Uh, and she said, oh, it's a much better deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all you do is you believe, yeah, you believe, okay, believe, and then that's it, don't have to do anything, don't have to be particularly kind, don't have to kind of do all this hard, don't have to meditate and all of this kind of stuff, yeah, you just believe, that's it. Uh, and for, she was too busy to be a Buddhist, so much better to be a Christian. Uh, so. <laughs> But that's not, that's not really a very good criterion, is it, if it's a better deal? You have to really understand whether it's a good deal or whether it's kind of a, one of those dodgy deals that sometimes you get. That's kind of the problem here. Yeah. So anyway, so don't be afraid of uh, using your intelligence to look at these things rationally and see whether it makes sense. Just because the majority of people in the world are Christians or Muslims uh, doesn't mean that those religions are true. Uh, as you will know, the majority is usually wrong. 
Yeah, it's true, isn't it? If the majority was right, then everybody in the world would be happy and there would be no problems. Uh, the majority usually, get, usually gets it wrong here. Yeah. So sometimes going against the stream is the right way. If you want to have more success than the average person, if you want to be more happy than the average person, if you want to be wiser than the average person, you can't just do what everyone else does. So if everyone else is a Christian, actually that's a good reason not to be a Christian probably. <laughs> So I'm, I'm being naughty now. I'm just, I, this is kind of the way I like to look at things. So this is just my personal opinions. Just ignore it if you don't like it. That's okay. Yeah. Anyway, so this is what we focus on. This is the important part of the first noble truth about dukkha. Yeah, is this things about death, the simple things that, that we can relate to and that we can understand and that we can use in our daily practice. Yeah? The idea of impermanence, things always being changeable. There's nothing in the world that you can hold on to. Nothing. Everything always changing. Whatever it is in the world that you think is attractive to you, interesting to you, that you want to hold on to, whatever that is, that is where you're going to suffer. Yeah, whenever you hear about something and it get upsets you, straight away you know you have a problem because you are holding on to something and now it is turning out to be unreliable, uncertain. You cannot hold on to it. Uh, this is what this first noble truth is telling us. Yeah? You cannot have things the way you want them all the time. It's impossible. Uh, and that is the problem with this world. Uh, and then what happens then? You don't despair. What happens then? You turn towards the spiritual path. Uh, you start to develop your mind instead, uh, because that is an area where you have some sort of power to make a difference. Uh, yeah, that's where we can actually do something. Uh, but in the external world, we don't have any power. And then comes the five aggregates. Uh, that is like an additional thing, just to give us the big picture of how bad this actually is. Yeah, it uh, dukkha kind of penetrates through everything ultimately, and then you take the spiritual path all the way to the end. Okay, let's have a break and uh, we'll see you back again about quarter to three here. Okay. Yeah, please. Okay. Sure, I will, yes. Yeah. When, okay. Yeah. Eventually. We'll see when it happens. Sir.